What up, everybody? What up, martial arts people? What up, weightlifting people, strength training people? I have planned something very special for today. I've looking. I've been looking forward to this the whole week, man. It was a crazy week. I've been out four days in Germany. I've been on a business trip. I've been training. I've been having a seminar about the tiger, and for sure, I also I also have been training myself in the gym. And today we are watching West Side versus the World. It's basically a powerlifting or the powerlifting documentary because some people say that west side gym west side barbell has the same meaning for powerlifting as gold's gym in venice you know where all the um, people from the golden era of bodybuilding trade Arnold schwarzenegger all the big ones has so i'm looking very forward to this and i'm going to show you the thumbnail you also have seen it on um, on the <clears throat> on the thumbnail of this video and Man, I would say let's enjoy ourselves, let's have a drink, have a protein shake, and watch this documentary Sunday together, right? I hope you get something out of this, I really hope, because I have skipped a little bit through it, and really, it's awesome, it's really awesome. Let's go into this. West Side versus the world. Do we have... Ooh, it's available even in 4K. The following film was independently produced by Westside Film with permission from Louis Simmons and Westside Barbell. Ah, one important thing, um, Louis Simmons is the head of Westside Barbell, yeah, and he used to power all these things that you're about to see. Maybe they're also talking about this. Um, he invented the reverse hyperextension machine, so to speak, or he has the patent of this machine, but not take anything before. Let's watch it, okay? God damn it, that dude already looks ridiculously strong. <laughs> I already know it's gonna be awesome. I read him. Doing pause squat. Really good for leveling up the squat game because you have more time on the tension, which is also really good for hypertrophy, for inducing hypertrophy, which is muscle growth. Sleeves. Yeah, man, let's go. So it's equipped. It's not a roll. So equipped with, with beer, uh, with the suits, with sleeves, uh, with elbow sleeves, whatever. Wow, it's a really wide stand squat, right? You look at this range of motion, yeah, for sure, shit, but wow. Did you see how many plates there were? Let's have a look at this. You really feel the energy, right? Here. Oh man. Two. There's a couple more behind here. One, two, three. Six, seven, eight. It's going to be about 10 plates each side, 20 plates. So it's a 400 plus, 425, no, 450 plus squat kilograms, 450 kilograms plus squat. I'm really trying not to puke. <laughs> Let's go. In the shadows of Columbus, Ohio, in the heartland of the American Rust Belt, lies the world's most controversial gym, <laughs> Westside Barbell. 
there's not a powerlifter on the planet that doesn't know the name Westside Barbell. Oh, yeah, man. Like the crazies. A collection of lunatics with some fucking crazy strength. World record holder after world record holder. I've seen a lot of guys come in. I've seen a lot of guys go out. People don't understand what a hardcore attitude you need to have in that gym. It was go time every time he walked through the door. Westside was a cult. And then this place, it would ride you to the top and break you. It was literally hell with weights. They were going to talk shit to you from the time you walked through that door until the time you left. It's a bunch of violent, mean motherfuckers that aren't kind and gentle in any way. Everyone lifts weights, but we're the best at it. You know, it's kind of like West Side versus the world. Let's have a look at this. A strength support compromise of free lifts, squat, bank press, and deadlift. A lifter's highest successful attempt at each lift is compiled to create a score called a total. The lifter with the highest total in each weight class wins. So, usually you have like three attempts in each discipline and you add the best, and then you have like the mean over all of those, and this then adds to the total. And whichever has the most in all of the three combined wins. Yeah, that's really some old school shit here. <laughs> Look at the camera. <laughs> to understand oh, the madness of Westside, you have to start with its founder, Louis Simmons. The only member that has to be a Westside Barbell is Louis Simmons. I'm trying to fucking think, man, how you can even put Louis in the work. Louis's like Yoda. It kind of looks like him now, too. And that motherfucker's a million years old. He's a dinosaur. These days, Louis is known mostly as a coach, but his story started long ago. My name's Louis Simmons. I live in Columbus, Ohio. I was born on October 12th, 1947. I'm the owner of Westside Barbell. We live on the west side of Columbus. And, you know, they call you West Siders kind of an insult, but to me, it's a badge of honor. Not only do I have a lot of tattoos say West Side for my gym, but also because I live on the West Side. I got 13 teeth. <laughs> That's all I got left. Fractured skull, broken jaw, broken hand. Just get my ass kicked, but it never stopped me. You know, I think you got to get your ass kicked. It's what you learn from losing. In the first grade, I got kicked out of school for an entire year. I got in a fight with a kid the day before he took my shoe, and I asked my father what to do. And he said, well, if you tell me that tomorrow, I'm basically going to kick your ass. So I remember going back to school and the kid tried to take my shoe and I'd gotten a fight and the teacher broke it up. So I ended up hitting a teacher. And lo and behold, it kicked me out for the entire year. So I had two days of school and I was kicked out for the rest of the year. Believe it or not, at 12 years old, I was a block tender. And I worked for a guy, drank all the time, but worked nine hours a day. I was around Masons. I mixed mortar and carried block. That's how I grew up, nothing but hard work. I was a loner for years. I, I couldn't talk to anyone. That's actually how weight started helping me. I got my first weight set at 12 years old. I was also a very good baseball player. One thing I think changed my mental aspect on myself to believe that I could be something a little different than, than others. For once, I hit a ball in the fence and absorbed all the people yelling and applauding me as I ran around the bases. I Olympic Man, the man's crazy. Years old. I thought really? I was pretty strong. Well, I lived in a power meet in Dayton, Ohio, and there was 11 men in my weight class. I beat one guy out of 11. He was 55 years old. And I said, this is my sport. I decided right there that I was never going to Olympic lift again. There was no comparison between who's the strongest. Then I got drafted. I have today ordered to Vietnam the Air Mobile Division. This will make it necessary to increase our active fighting forces by raising the monthly draft call. So he went to the military as well. Right out of high school, I was uh, drafted in the army. I was going on my way to Vietnam, but my wow. father died. I'm a full surviving son, and so I never went to Vietnam. The death of his father meant that Louis was the last male heir of the Simmons family. As such, 
he was reassigned from basic training. Instead of fighting communism in the jungles of Vietnam, he would be stationed eye to eye with it in Berlin. It was there that he came across the writings of an innovative gym nearly 6,000 miles away in Culver City, California. Right behind me there, that's uh, Bill Peters West. He was originally of the original Westside Barbell Club, Culver City, California. And he worked for Muscle Power Built. Uh, you know, there's nothing to do, you know, when you're on base, you know, you don't have to be out doing all this stuff. Here's my only training thing, look at magazines. Their club had box squats and board press and all these things that uh, you see in my club today, actually. They were they went years ahead of everybody else. It was always my dream to go there. That's why anyone that comes here, I never turn them down. But my dream was to go there, and I couldn't. So anyone who wants to come here, can come. I got out want the to go there. In 69. So I started competing full time in the beginning of 1970. And I had no training partners. I'd go to meet, and then uh, I would talk to the best lifters in the world. I was never afraid to talk and ask questions. As it went along, it seemed like he was giving a lot more information than he was getting. He would just open the floodgates and just start talking strength, talking bench presses, talking squats, talking deadlifts. He really loved what he was doing. Louis made quick strides. In 1971, I was already nice little meat record holder in a squat. In February of 73, I took 60.55. No wrap of any kind. You couldn't wear a wrist strap. I had the highest total in the world at that point. And then I uh, broke my back. I thought my back was impervious to pain. I, I thought it would hold anything. But I lost my concentration then, good morning. And then broke to L5. Maybe this is a story how he came up with the reverse hyperextension machine. Pain, couldn't work, couldn't do nothing. No doctor could fix me. This is 1973. I had to set a goal. I had to come back. With no other options, Louis looked to his training for answers. I used to do a lot of hyperextensions and back raises. But what if I did it? It is. It is. So I built up a platform and jumped up and swung my legs underneath and back. And it, it first it didn't yeah. hurt. And it pumped my back up. This is a glimpse of hope. And I thought, well, what if I added weights? So I finally, uh, we made a machine, but no one had ever seen it. The reverse hyper would remain a secret for over 15 years. Wow. Until an unlikely event inspired Louis to introduce it to the public. Larry Bird, he said he's going to have to retire because he had a bad back. So I said, well, hell, if he had a reverse hyper, he wouldn't have a bad back. I was obligated to get the thing out in the general public so people don't have bad backs. All right, folks, we're going to perform some reverse hyper extensions. Our day is going to demonstrate this. Every time you use this machine, it works as restoration. This is one of the greatest exercises for the lower back. And, and this invention ever powered the whole thing financially so over two decades. Thanks to the reverse hyper, Louis was back under the bar by the mid-70s. His broken back was as good as new. That was enough to win Louis the 1980 YMCA Nationals. The YMCA Nationals was the best of the best. All came there. Anyone that was at the biggest Nationals was at the YMCA Nationals. The 70s had seen the introduction of supportive equipment, like wrist and knee wraps, which helped lifters to handle more weight. But in 1977, the game changed for good. A company called Marathon released a singlet cut from a stretchy canvas material. It was called the squat suit. It looked like a wrestling singlet was just uh, two sizes too small. You know, we all got them. <laughs> there were 50 lifters it's really squeezy. The squat, suits. the squat suit ushered in an era of supportive equipment, commonly known as gear. Gear is nothing short of compression. So when you're performing a lift, the flesh doesn't have to bind up around the joint to stop everything. The gear has that stopping power due to compression. And yeah, that's the same what the weight lifting belt does. By 1984, gear would be introduced for the bench press as well. Notice the padding under his shirt, or is that padding? What exactly is that? Gary? It's actually just an illusion, but that's called a bench press shirt. It protects you from getting any tears or injuries. Oh. The original bench shirt was a tight polyester shirt. It took three people to try to pull your head through this little hole and try to pull your <laughs> arms out like this. And it was, and you could get the same results with wearing, you know, two tight t-shirts. Back in Columbus, Louis' passion and prowess had made him a key figure on the scene. But it was his belief in others that led lifters to join him. When I met him, I had never had anyone tell me that I was going to be great at anything. It was life-changing. My girlfriend thought I'd lost my mom. 
so people could pick up on it. But he invited me out to the garage. In the early 80s, a gang of powerlifters was a sight few had seen in Columbus. Louis' garage quickly became something of neighborhood lore. Now, a buddy of mine lived started with the garage gym. Wow. Well. And he always talked about these big guys that trained out, out back in this garage. When you first seen the place, you lifted the garage door up and it was dirt and concrete. It was different. On the platform, on, on the bar in this power rack, the 100 pound plates were welded to the bar. So if you couldn't start with 245, you just couldn't work out. <laughs> what the fuck? You were either in dirt Imagine you, you come to a gym today and the things are welded to the bar. So the gym says basically you're too weak to be here. Oh man. <laughs> that's that's not imaginable in today's like weak or yeah, so to speak. Well, possibly offended society. <laughs> Shit. On the floor or you laid something down to not be in the dirt. I mean you were getting eat up by mosquitoes because the windows were broke. A lot of the guys at that time were going to a world's gym or wherever they were going because it's nice. I thought, no, you know. So I finally got his attention and I wanted to talk to him. And I finally told him I wanted to lift weights. And he laughed at me and said, I got women stronger than you, kid. My first day in Louis's garage was a Friday afternoon. It was a squat day. He comes rolling up in this big iron workers welding truck and jumps out with the coverall on, a wife beater tank top. I was like, this cat's scary. He was looking for the strongest people he could find and people that he could make with them. That first group did some amazing things. But Louis was about to go back to square one. Well, then I managed to break my back again in 1981. I tried a heavy squat in a power rack. I missed it, I dumped it forward, but I put the pins too low. So it pinned me between the box and the bar. He had broken the same L5 vertebrae from 1973. Oh, shit. At that point, I said, I'm not going to quit lifting, but I better find a better way. As he looked around, Louis wasn't the only one fighting off injuries. The lifters I saw, they were starting to get beat up. A lot of very strong guys, but he didn't last. The common denominator seemed to be the way that everyone trained in America. There was only one path to follow, Western periodization. As the weights go up, volume comes down. They start with high reps, build muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Then you drop some reps and you start to build some power. Then you do the big weights before a contest. Now you've really dropped your volume. So really, you're detraining. Your level of preparedness is going down all the time. Then when you're handling the big weights, you have no base. Your level of physical preparedness is not there when you're going to a contest. It makes no sense. To find the answers that Louis was looking for, he turned to America's most bitter rival. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. Back then, you talked to Mr. Reagan, the Russians were commie bastards. Who's going to do what a commie bastard's going to do? The Eastern Bloc countries, Russia, Bulgaria, they worship strength. Louis knew that the Soviets had the science powerlifting desperately needed. So he sent away. <laughs> if you would look at this man, you wouldn't even that think that he's lifting he has a lot when you see him in like out in the public. He tells me, he says, well, you know, Lou, this is a classroom books. That's exactly what I need. I need to understand my own sport. The Soviet texts broke strength training down into different methods for developing what were called special strengths. The base of all strengths was absolute strength, which was built through the maximal effort method. On well, max every day, you're exerting all the muscle units that you have. That's what makes max effort superior to all methods. You use more muscle units. But as Louis would come to realize, you couldn't simply max out every workout. And I'm nah, thinking, well, I'm getting slower. That's slower unsustainable. All, all the guys that I'm training with are getting slower and slower. We need to become faster. You only have so long to make a lift. And we can hold your breath so long, or take so much pain, or strain so long. So we, how could I lift larger weights faster? I started using a dynamic method. You know, maximal speed plus sub-maximal weights. Four sequels, mass times, acceleration. In other words, use two days. One day to become stronger, the other day to become faster. This set up a mathematical formula. By rotating maximal and dynamic effort workouts, Louis devised a way to keep crazy, man. and technique consistently high. To avoid any fall off in fitness or muscle size, Louis followed these methods up with the repetition method, using high volume single joint exercises. The final key element of Louis's new system was to rotate different variations of exercises to avoid the law of accommodation. 
the law of you actually have a detraining effect you start to go backwards that's why you must switch exercise together these concepts formed what was called the conjugate method meaning that the various components of strength were developed in conjunction with one another. Louis's methods weren't immediately met with open arms. Louis, at first, with these weird ideas, was thought of as kind of a quack. It would take something big to prove him right. Louis really didn't get popular, even in the lifting community, until Matt Dremel came along. One of the original super heavyweight members of Westside Barbell's name was Matt Dremel. Just a big, fat, redheaded kid. I want to be the world's strongest man. What do I do? I said, you get as big as you can, you take on the drugs you can. He says, all right. He did. That pudgy, red-headed kid would grow into a 380-pound sensation. He was a large man. He was very thick, long red mane, big red beard. Kind of reminds you of a 1980s. Did some, something kilograms, by the way. He didn't just look like a Viking. He lived like one. I remember one story. We were in a bar. Man was a little fucked up. Kind of bumps into one of the guys. One of the men at the table said something to him. He turned around, looked at me, and he goes, "Be right back, buddy." And he just takes the table and he stands it up against the wall and just dumps all the guys on the ground with the popcorn and the pizza and the pitchers of beer and says, "Ha ha ha, motherfuckers!" <laughs> it was your average Tuesday night with Matt Dimmel. <laughs> I mean, Matt Dimmel tried to kill me. <laughs> what the fuck? Going to work out. He kept talking about pain. I nose in his head. He starts putting all this lotion on and all these knee wraps and we're benching. I says, damn it, Matt, I told you that stuff's in your head. And he turned around at me and he grabbed me and ran me up in the corner and I got him like in the Linda Blair. I got his head turned all the way around. Somehow we stopped and I immediately lay down on the bench and did my bench set. Like, this is no big deal. So we ride <laughs> home together. That's the way it is. Yeah, him and Louie were thicker than thieves. I think Louie becomes a mentor and somewhat of a father figure for people and I think he was like that with Matt. In 1985, Matt Dimmel became Louis' first all-time world record holder by squatting a historic 1,010 pounds. Actually, I have had so, one of the I just check what this is in kilograms. Pounds, Matt Dimmel. It's a thousand fucking pounds. It's about two and a half somewhere. Days. So someone does it, the whole powerlifting world takes notice. People really started listening close to what Louis Simmons had to say. Those were big things for me. I mean, that was the beginning. And then it built, and it built, and it built, and it built. To immortalize the lift, Louis wrote it down on what would become one of Westside's symbolic traditions. So, 1,010 pounds is 458.1 kilogram. Freaking fucking hell. My max is 160. <laughs> the board. I remember that chalkboard from when I was a junior in high school. Oh, that board at Westside is everything. To say your name's on the board means more than, than coming to the gym, I do believe. It's a funny thing about my gym. There's world record holders over the years that my people don't even know who they are because they've been wiped off the board. By 1986, Louis' gym had national champions and an all-time world record holder. It wasn't long after that Louis moved his motley crew out of the garage and into a commercial <laughs> gym. He chose the name Westside Barbell after the Culver City gym he had read about in the army and hung the banner of what would become Westside's official coat of arms, a pit bull. The pit bull, yeah. Nitro. Westside Barbell is built on dogs. Dogs never let me down. You can lock your wife in the trunk and you can lock your dog in the trunk. And you can open up the trunk and your wife would be mad, but the dog would be glad to see you. The new space attracted new lifters. Among them was a young Chuck Vogelpohl. He came to the commercial gym and, you know, he wanted to be strong. And next thing you know, he's breaking world records. From the start, Chuck fit right in with the rough and tumble crew. Come on, Chuck, rip motherfucker! The hardcore precedence of West Side Barbell was set by Louis Simmons, Chuck, and Matt Demo. The new location also brought in a couple of bench press specialists. Like Chuck, Kenny Patterson was a kid from the neighborhood. I started Kenny at 14 years old. He lived in the neighborhood. He came to the gym. And we're going, gee, this kid looks like he's got potential. Just the way he was built, huge arms. One of, like, the most satisfying things I ever done was the day I actually outbenched Chuck. You know, so that was one of those things where it was like, maybe you've arrived. Across town, George Halbert had heard rumors about Westside. I was training just at a local gym, and the gym owner is not going to always say, you don't want to go to Westside Barber. That's a bad place to be. 
But the first time I worked out with him, there was so much energy, there was no way I wasn't coming back. In one year, George went from 475 to a 628 pound bench. Mm. Louis ran the front of his gym as a paid commercial facility, but his powerlifting club continued in a separate back room. He had the back area, which was kind of just for the powerlifters. He had police caution tape, you know, on the racks, like, don't use these racks. Regular gym goers were advised for their own good to leave the powerlifting area alone. At that time, I didn't really know these guys that well, and I was warned to stay off the bench tons of times. I had laid down on the bench, and I heard the door open, and then Lou came in. Matt Dimmel was right behind him, and Chuck Vogelpool. Before I could get off the bench, they had piled on me and beat me. I had bruises down my legs, on my arms. Oh my God, I couldn't walk. By 1991, Louis was not possible today. The gym was strong, <laughs> Shit. and his new style of training had put him back in the game. But the wear and tear was starting to show. I've had a bad knee injury since 84. I felt every once in a while meets that I get around 800 in a squat. I get this feeling sliding. Well, I did 735 low box squat in the gym, and I felt my knee slide. Chuck said, take another one. I said, put it on. So I put it on 760, and I walked it out with my kneecap in it. I had heard 12 patellas break in half. I heard him sound like a broomstick. And little did I know, I didn't oh. hear my own snap in half, but I did. Yeah, they operate on me within two hours. I told him I'm allergic to anesthesia. It was a three and a half hour operation, awake the whole time. I was off crutches in like seven, eight weeks, walking around. I was already starting to squat again. The second surgery sees where it went wrong. I went back in to get the wires taken out. I was supposed to be home within four Is this not a story about him? When he leaves hospital, he straight goes to the gym with his um, cameras and because he cannot um, squat, he's going to bench uh, maybe 160 or something I have in my head. That's also one crazy story about Lou Simmons. Four hours of the Let's whole see. Episode. They gave me a shot to calm me down for the surgery and when I fell asleep, they came in and the anesthesiologist gave me anesthesia. And at that time, I went in convulsions and I didn't breathe for four minutes. And I could just feel people like beat me up on top of me, sticking the chest tubes in me and cutting my throat. And you know, treat me. I was in a medically induced coma for three days. And I finally come to, and I, you know, I'm looking around all these tubes in me, and I look under the covers, and my knees not even operate on. So I instantly get mad. Finally get out. My throat was taped shut, and had stitches in my sides. My wife and Chuck Vogelpool drive me out of the hospital to the gym, and Vogelpool says, you're maxing out. So, I lay it down, is and I can story. see with a hole in my throat, oh, and chest tube, and leg in a cast. And I can remember picking him up off the bench, I mean, he's got a hole. And that's when it tells you, no matter what you've got wrong, there's not an excuse. There's never an excuse. Eventually, the casts came off. But flatlining on an operating table had wrecked Louis's mind. My brain was destroyed. What the well fuck? What the lunatic? Work. I mean, I was a crane operator. Basically, couldn't remember how to run. God it. damn it. To make things even worse, the event had left Louis with a permanent complication. Since 1991, I've never slept more than an hour at a time. My wife can vouch for this. That son of a bitch will not sleep. And it's because when they trick his throat, when he falls asleep, his esophagus closes. And it causes him to choke and wake up. You know, it'd be like me getting ready to choke you right before you fall asleep. You're not going to sleep very long, right? So I'm in severe oh, pain. Oh, I'm 43, and I said, well, time for me to give this up. Injuries and a brief case of death had finally done him in. If he couldn't compete, Louis would build Westside into the world's strongest gym. To do that, he needed more bodies. I remember Louis, right when I went up on the platform, sticking his fingers in my belt. He's saying, breathe into your stomach, breathe into your stomach. Show me how fat you are. And I'm like, what the fuck is this old man doing? So then I get another bar and I, I took the bar out and I'm like, oh my God, this feels like nothing. This guy's magic. It was after that that we spoke a little bit more and I said, look, I'm one semester away from graduating. He's like, well, you should move down to Columbus. And I remember leaving that day thinking, this is where I need to be. But even as Dave had uprooted his life to come to Westside, he still wasn't sold on Louis's training. I didn't believe anything Louis said for about a year. And I trained in the afternoon, I kept doing my old shit. He argued with me about training. He must have went nowhere for six months or eight months or ten months. And got to a point where Louis was ready to throw me out. 
So it was one of those conversations where it was like, okay, I understand. Here's the deal. I will change my schedule at work and I'll come in and train in the morning. You tell me what the fuck to do. I'll do what you do. That way, if I don't get better, it's your fault, not mine. And my total went up to Yeah, you. totally true, yeah. Test it that way. Despite the new faces, Matt Dimmel was still Westside's resident alpha male. But this didn't stop challenges from the up-and-coming Chuck Vogel pole. I always told that Chuck, don't mess with Matt. Said he's too big and he's faster than you think. And Matt was probably 380, 385 pounds, and Chuck was a little 198 pounder. So Chuck decides he's going to wrestle Matt. Matt gets him in a guillotine and broke his neck. And Chuck had a neck. And Chuck went from a 485 bench to a 135 bench. So he goes to the doctor, gets his neck x-ray. Doctor comes like running in and puts him in a fucking neck brace like this and said, if you'd have sneezed, you'd have been a quad. Matt Dimmel had been a terror since he came to West Side, both in and out of the gym. Matt was a crazy fucker. He probably had a rap siege longer than probably anybody in Columbus. I bailed Matt Dimmel out of jail about every two months. Get a call in the middle of the night, $535, go downtown, bait a bailiff. When he would let him out of the gym. When I first got there, Matt was still in prison. But when he came out, he seemed like he really wanted to do well again and clean up his act. And he started training and he won the senior nationals, but then somehow that kind of fell by the wayside. The years of living hard and lifting heavy were taking their toll on Matt. Matt had injuries that he should have been able to come back from. And it really bothered me. That was the downfall. You could see the start. The injuries sent Matt into a dark spiral met this girl that was a stripper. She got him into heroin, and that was that. Lou tried to guide him, and he did, but you can't force somebody to be sober. At that time, he wasn't going out of his apartment, was kind of holed up and paranoid and all that. Matt got caught up, and I couldn't stop it anymore. I could control it for a while. We were that good of friends that at a certain point, even I couldn't control it. He died when I was 31. He was 34. The MD. They were MD'd on cocaine and heroin. His girlfriend loaded up an eight ball of cocaine and two grams of heroin in one syringe and shot up his arm one time. His heart literally exploded. And when I found him, his head bled all over the bedroom floor through his mouth. I remember the day. Matt had passed away. And what I remember more than anything else is when we got into the gym, you know, I don't know who it did or what happened. It just, you know, it's just, this one's for Matt. And somebody just fucking cranked up the ACDC as loud as it would go. And we just fucking benched our asses off. And that was, that was our send off. He was our first world record holder. I mean, he was a good friend. He's like my stepson. Was dealing with losing him different? No. Louis didn't go to the funeral. I didn't go to his funeral. He's just, he was gone. But he was buried with the Westside Barbell Street. I don't think he, he ever came into how strong he really was. I don't think he got a, I don't think he got a chance to show it. He would have been right up there with a lot of the guys now. And that's why I always wondered what it would have been like if he was still around. What numbers could he have put up? I mean, no one knows. Matt would be among the first deaths at Westside, but certainly not the last. Among the first? Today, oh, shit. The quiet back wall stands as the only subtle nod to death and the ultimate price of life under the iron. You get out of my gym, you also notice what that's there on one wall. Susie Benford, world champion, died of cancer. She had cancer before she ever came to the gym. At 97 pounds, she deadlifted 347. And Tom Pellucci. Tom Pellucci Stronger than me. Got that. And he died of heart attack. Should go to the gym later. Like <laughs> for around 29 years prior to that. And his son's still in my gym. So on the other wall, you got those men from the original Westside Barber Club. And they're dead. So if you want to get a picture of my gym of yourself, die and get famous first. And I'll put your picture up. If you're a suck lifter, you're not getting your picture. <laughs> Some hard words, man. He abandoned the commercial gym and moved his lifters into a small facility in a rundown strip mall. Thankfully. Louie found another place. We went to a gym on the same road, Denver's Road, 800 square feet with the windows blacked out in the ghetto. He wanted to have it back like the old days on Larkham. Step one of bringing back the old garage feeling was dropping the membership fee and hand selecting his lifters. Here you are training at the strongest gym in the world with the best coach in the world, and it costs zero dollars. He keeps <laughs> it free because he puts the time and effort into people that he deems worthy. 
as the gym grew, Louis became more of a coach. <clears throat> His focus became everyone else and not himself. I thought, you know, as I got older, I mean, I broke every bone in my body. I've almost died twice in this sport. And I said, well, you know, eventually I got to teach people how to train correctly. I started making tapes because I still had I had all these good lifters in the gym. I'm Louis Simmons. This is West Side Barbell. I've made over 20 DVDs. I made a DVD in the mid-90s with the Green Bay Packers. I'm Kent Johnston, strength and conditioning coach for the Green Bay Packers. When I was in college, my roommate, he had the West Side Barbell videos, and there was a number at the very end, and so I called the number, and literally he talked me through the program. I hear on the other line, West Side, this is Louis, and I'm like, holy fuck, it's Louis Simmons. <laughs> Why is he picking up his own phone? What is going on here? There was no let me get on YouTube and watch it. If you wanted to know something, you had to call somebody on the phone or get a Powerlifting USA. When I started looking at West Side, it was through Powerlifting USA. In the 90s, we had a lot of teams used to come and hang out with us as strength coaches. You know, going to the Green Bay Packers training camp to train them, you know, or the Chicago Bulls coaches. Man, that's what I want you to do. That's what I want you to do. People paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to coach million dollar athletes are coming to listen to, you know, six guys on a Friday morning during a squat workout. In the early 90s, we showed up to Columbus Wild, forgot to get Louie's address. So I thought, well, I'll call some gyms and I'll ask around. The first two gyms refused to tell me where it was. They said, we're not going to be liable for what happens to you. Finally, the yeah. third guy says, yeah, yeah, I know where it's at, but you, you don't know where you got this information from. <laughs> first of all, all the windows are painted black. You don't know whether you're walking in the West Side Barbell or whether you're walking into some shady strip club or something like that. I was looking for this. <laughs> but you didn't, you actually didn't know where the gym was. And that's so crazy because when a place doesn't need a sign, that's, that speaks for itself. That speaks for itself, really. Wow. Big neon sign saying West Side, and Louis Simmons, and you show up and it's just, it's really a dump. But you see these massive men lifting massive amounts of weight. You really don't know what true strength is until you watch these guys train. But what really got me about it was the competitive nature of Westside. Any given morning could turn into a full-blown competition with cash in the chalk bowl within minutes. And then they just messed with each other. You know, it got kind of violent. I kept thinking, well, are they going to all start fighting here in a minute? Or is this just activity? This is just how they operate. Yeah, let's get crazy, man. We're not here in church here. We're lifting weights. Looking back on it, it's like, well, what was the positive quality of all of it? I don't know. But I, we all got stronger. <laughs> By now, powerlifting was evolving. In the late 80s, that federation split. Ernie France developed the APF. It started off at single ply, and then it developed more into multi ply. Multi ply. The National Power Building Federation. Year, a lifter war. The original squat suit. Oh, yeah, the reverse grip. Do you see that? Of a single layer of material. Eventually, want to have a quick look at this again? Squat suit and bench shirts had been constructed of a single layer of material. Eventually, somebody doubled up on the layers, and a new breed of extreme mm. lifting was born. Multiply is top fuel. So you're already strong. You put that on, you're even stronger. But then they had to learn how to train with that equipment. You gotta find that way to be poetry in your gear and not look like yes. you put clothes on a refrigerator. All of a sudden, the crazy dudes jump into multiply and that took on a whole different direction on its own. It was a huge dominance of all the multiply stuff. Then the WPO comes along, they're offering big money. So where does everybody go? We went to WPO. If you like incredible displays of strength, then put down that remote. You've come to the right place. This is the first professional powerlifting championship. The WPO paired the aggressive nature of multiply lifting with the lights and spectacle of professional wrestling. What were you thinking <laughs> before going up there? They're banging your head. What was that all about? Let's just get the blood up from there. <laughs> what it is, I didn't want to lose all sense. They go incredibly insane. The Federation recruited the top lifters in the world to compete head to head for big cash prizes. That's how you do it, man. Make it a show. Everybody a chance to reach a pro level in powerlifting, which was multiply. With money on the line, the innovation of the gear really took off, especially with bench shirts. One year, all of our guys got their shirts on. You know, we're all 
Jack in these tight shirts, and these two cats come over here, and they got their shirts got clean up the back. Louie's like, what the hell? How's that gonna work? We watch this guy in the warm-up room barely bench 405 and put this shirt on and take 660 and ram it off the boards. And I looked at Louie and I said, what? I don't know, but we're gonna talk to him when the meet's over. Sunday morning, Lou is over there with a pair of fucking scissors cutting up $200 France Ben shirts. Notifications <laughs> to the gear would send numbers soaring for years to come. Through the years, most of the names Westside was known for had trained early in the morning with Louie. But as the gang grew larger, it eventually spilled over into a second, less heralded shift, the night crew. Despite sharing a roof, the night crew treated Louie in the morning loop as... By the way, let's have a look at this one here. I want to, I want to tell you something. Years to come. Through the years, most of the names Westside was known for had trained early in the morning with Louie. But as the gang grew here. larger, it eventually... Have a look at what he's doing now. He spilled over into a second, less heralded shift. Deadlift? He's doing a classical deadlift, but he has uh, bands here. The bands, the resistance curve of a band is, the more you flex it, the more it wants to go back in its natural position or in its neutral position. Where are you the weakest at a deadlift? It is at the lowest when the de the bar is dead on the floor. To lift it up is the heaviest part and then it becomes easier, 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 easier the more you get it up. So the bands here match perfectly the lifting curve of the deadlift or of the strength curve of the deadlift. Makes perfect sense. When you talk about um, a chin up, a pull up, and you have like those assistance uh, helps with the bands. This is counterproductive because it's the same, but on the opposite here. Because you are the weakest at the top to really squeeze your chin over the top of the bar, and you are the strongest on the downside. You can lift your you can lift yourself up to the middle, but then go really to the top is the hard part. So there it doesn't make sense because the curves of the resistance doesn't match. So the curve of the lifting helps from the resistance band doesn't match the curve of the exercise. Have this in mind. Really have this in mind. Larger, it really aggressive. <laughs> spilled over into a second, less heralded shift, the night crew. Despite sharing a roof, the night crew treated Louie in the morning loop as hostiles. The night crew hated me. All I had to do is walk into the place and they were, they were ticked off at me. But I always had a saying that the AM crew was 12 hours ahead of the PM crew. One of the first major rivalries between the two units featured Kenny Patterson and George Halbert. When it came to the bench press, Kenny Patterson simply could not be beat. Kenny was the number one lifter in the world. I was a world record holder 242 and 220, along with 275, all at the same time. He edged out George at every turn. I knew that I wasn't going to beat him at 275. I went down to 220, and I broke my first world record. And then I went up to 242, and I broke my second world record. Well, Kenny decided he's gonna come down to 242. And Kenny came down to 242, took my world record away. If he walked out of there- We're talking about weight classes, The I first think. thing in my mind was I need to get back to the gym, because I have to get that back. With no way around Kenny, George tried a bold weight cut. One of my training partners was a former bodybuilder. And I talked to him and I said, how do I get lean? came down to 198, or I went to a local meet, opened up with the world record, I made it easy, and I left. Then, the rise was on. He broke eight world records in a bench in a row. That's when myself and George and Chuck and Dave, that's when we kind of created our era. When Westside rolled into a meet, the whole room took notice. If you go to a meet, you see the Westside crew, you know this just, shit just got real, because their names were on all the records. I can remember why I weighed in at a meet, Dean Glick, Goes, oh, you're the only one here from Westside? And I went, no, the rest of them are coming. I'm just the one they sent in first. And around the corner, here comes the rest of them. And he just put his head down. I went, oh. apparently you didn't like that answer. Apparently you know that you guys are going to get beat. We would bring like a group of 20 or 30 dudes to a meet, and they all would be gigantic. That's when we started to dominate. We won the APF seniors 93, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And their world body the WPC in an international contest, you score six people. Cool. You know, Americans score six, everybody scores six. Well, Westside had fourth first in two seconds. We would have won the world two years ago. 
we would have beat the United States and everybody else. Is how dominant we were. And a lot of people don't even know that, you know. They didn't you know people popped up in the two thousands. They only hated since then. West Side's ascent was not built off of brutality and testosterone alone. I mean, if you want to know about the explosion of the nineties and what happened, what happened was chains and bands. For years, Louis had chased an idea called accommodating resistance, where the resistance increased to meet the strength curve of the lifter. The Soviets had written about accommodating resistance. <laughs> That's what Louis I've been talking to about. A way to apply it to the barbell. The closest he had ever seen was a Soviet device called a weight releaser. Weight releasers are an apparatus that the Russians started years ago. When it went down, they would hit the bottom and jump off the bar. An old man called me on one time. Well, no, the concept of the weight release, just I told him, said that's like chains. I said, well, explain what you mean. They used to put chains on the bar. They would go down. The chain would unload. Just this week, I have squatted my first time um, with chains. And it's really, that's crazy. Because it's the same. It's the resistance curve match. Sorry. <laughs> the resistance curve matches perfectly. Because when you have, when you have the bar here on top, and you squat down and you have the chains on the side. As you go down, you get weaker because the flexion of your knees and your hips, the angles are less favorable for your movement. So you get weaker as you go down. And the turning point is the hardest point. So when you really ask to grasp, this is the hard point to go up. Because you go with the negative first, which is easy, and then the positive pressing up with the deadlift it's the opposite you have first the positive going up this is the hard part and then you can release and with the with the squat with the chains it's as you get lower and lower and lower you are dropping weight because more of the parts of the chains are on the floor and are not adding to the weight itself and as you go up then it gets heavier 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 because you get also stronger because you go up Man, it's really, if you have chains around your gym, try this. Really, try this. It's an amazing tool. The length should fall on the ground, then come back off and you lift it up. I go, wow, that's, that's better than what I'm doing. So I started using chains, and I, I never wrote about them. Then we went to three major meets. I was reading an article that he wrote about how you use chains for resistance. Man, I got to go see how but he's doing that. Resistance bands wouldn't work here. Bands. So when I went out to see Louis, because the movement is different, and I told him oh. about the bands. Okay, it, technically it would work, but using bands, I knew about them, but I didn't know where to get them. Never it would be crazy because because they go the curve, the resistance curve for resistance band is lo is not linear. It's more of exponential. So he told me about Dick Carson with jump stretch at the time. So Dick came to Columbus, Ohio, actually that weekend to do a basketball seminar. So when I went up and I looked at these bands, but I go, what if I put them on my shoulders? And I stood up. In the bottom, I had no tension, but when I stood up, it turned into mm -hmm. 250. I realized right then, I oh, okay. put these on a barbell. The bands constitute extra kinetic energy. The barbell is going down faster than actually gravity. The key to strength is over speed of centuries. The faster down, the faster up. Change oh, not provide okay. over speed of centuries. Bands do. We got them, went back, so hooked them on barbells, and lo and behold, mm -hmm. My gym took another tremendous surge in strength. I mean, we hung those fucking things on everything you could hang on. You'd look at it and go, you sure that's safe? And the first guy would get fucking obliterated, and I'd be like, whoa, way too much band tension. Back that one down a little bit. We were pushing the boundaries of everything we brought in there. What's really cool is the reason we got the bands was because people would send them stuff. And be like, hey, try this out. I learned these concepts by accident. Someone called me to ask okay. me. A That's question. interesting. I didn't know that. From them. And a guy one time said, well, Louis Simmons never invented chains and he didn't invent bands. And I said, That's right. I didn't invent toilet paper here. I'm smart enough to use it. <laughs> I took the bands into the bench press arena and Chuck took the bands into the squat arena. He discovered the more bands that he used, the stronger he got. On squat day, when you walked in, Chuck so actually the, the man. resistance curve of the bands, the more gym, exponential helps even more. Awesome. Got the dry dude. You just didn't know what was going to happen with him. When they would call Chuck Vogelpohl, the fucking back row would stand up and fill the aisles. He'd get out there, he'd, sometimes he'd unrack it, go down and just fall with it, you know what I mean? You're like, oh. Then 
he'd come back out and fucking spitting on it, headbutt it, get under it again, stand up with it, go down, sit down there, and you think he's gonna fall and fucking blast it like somebody couldn't take it faster than that. Chuck was never weak, but the stronger he was, the worse he was to be around. But he was as normally strong, he wasn't so bad. As he's getting stronger, he was intolerable. I remember somebody coming up to me and said, be careful train with Chuck because he'll try to put you in the hospital. If you're in his crew, there's probably a good chance that you're going to get hurt. He would try to kind of haze people out of the gym. He would just train them until they snap. When I tore my tricep off, walking in the gym and Chuck's in there. Hey, good, you're here. I wanted to work with you. I can't do anything. I'm in a brace. He said, well, come over here and lay down. So I laid down. Chuck goes over and gets a leg wrap and ties my brace to the power rack and ties a big old knot in it. He brings the 80 over. Hands me the dumbbell and says, do a set of 10. You gotta keep your left side strong so your right side will stay strong. And at that point, we started to do about, oh, I don't know, 15 sets of 10 before he would untie me. It got to the point where if I would see Chuck's truck in the parking lot, I would just make a U-turn, get right back on the highway and go home. He worked his ass <laughs> off to make you earn your way in there, to bleed for it. You weren't gonna not do a set or skip an exercise because you were afraid of what was gonna happen if you did. He was the one that took your key from you. If someone was messing up, he'd say, Lou, you gotta kick him out, gotta get the key. And I'd kick him out to so I'm gonna put up a Chuck. Louie let Chuck really delegate in that gym. If you came in and you wanted to squat light that day and Chuck was squatting heavy, you're squatting heavy. It don't matter what you want. He had the 10 world records in the squat. Who are you? When the gym started using bands, no one benefited more than Chuck Vogelpoe. He had a thousand pound squat. And we started using tons and tons of bands, and he actually went up to 1,180 in the squat. But I will tell you that that is not even close to the level of strength that he had. Chuck was posting world records in competition, but somehow what he was doing in the gym was even more astounding. I watched Chuck do 885 and 640 pound of bands. This is insane. What would equate to a 1,400 pound squat? You almost realize, like, he may not be human. Chuck pulled 900 in the gym, but only 835 in me. The problem was Chuck would never taper, and he would get too psyched up. I knew it was wrong. I went back and laid three books what out to show Chuck why he should do this, and Chuck looked at the books for 15 seconds and walked out. I put the books in my truck and never ever said another word. Chuck would become the greatest pound-for-pound -pound squatter the world had ever seen. But for Louie, the thought of how much better he could have been is one that still haunts him. Yeah, maybe 1,300 pounds squat, the biggest ever. And he would have done it at 265 pounds. But I could never get him to taper down like everybody else. He wanted to do more. Louis had turned a ragtag bunch of pounds from the west side of Columbus into a well-oiled machine. But success bred complacency. Especially 590 kilograms. Kenny Patterson. He bent 712 for the first world record and then bent 728. But then he didn't go anywhere. I says, Kenny, I'm going to come out of retirement and squat seven before you ever bend seven again. And he says to me, old man, you'll never have 700 on your back again. Well, I come out of retirement right there. He was 43 when injuries had forced him to retire before. And now, at 50, the time off hadn't done him any favors. I was as bad as ever because I never really recovered. I had so much neck problems. I mean, sometimes I couldn't bend 185 pounds until my arms were broken. But somehow, miraculously, I came back. How I actually competed, I lived on cough syrup and Tylenol PMs. And I about OD'd on Tylenol PMs, so I dumped those. When I was 50, no one had ever been 550, and I'd been 600. It's six best bench in the country. Benching 600 was impressive, sure. But Kenny had challenged Louis to put a bar on his back. That meant squatting. Louis started right where he had left off. I tore my knee off in the gym at 760. So my first meet back, I squat 760. I did 16 straight squats in a row. It's seven, eights, and nines. Never got one turned down. I was the only person over 50 to squat over nine. I did 920. I was third best squat in the world that year. Fourth on the total. Well, 900 in gear, it's not that impressive anymore. But back then, it was. He was 50 years old. How in the fuck he did what he did is beyond me. When I came back, my dream was a total elite total. I go, there'd be no way. But when I came back, I was total elite. So like today's pro totals, these kids make up four or five years. I did my pro total for 37. Top 10 squat bench or deadlift with or without gear. No one's ever done that. That's the Lifetime Achievement Award, you know. You'd get an Oscar for that. What did it was Kenny. 
He made me take so much cross serve that I shouldn't even drive a cross. But that's what it took. Louis had always said that if you run with the lame, you'll develop a limp. Well, none of his guys limped. And they didn't care how old Louis was or what he was coming back from. They were going to push him like any other lifter who wanted to call himself Westside. Oh, I purposely try to fuck with him. And I'm not going to lie, there's times I've tried to make him get hurt. That was my goal, to put him the fuck out. He came in one day and said, I got to take it easy. I'm just going to do accessories today. And I just laid into his ass. Like, you fucking pussy. I don't care how fucked up you are. Next week, I'll be fucked up. Are you going to let me off the hook? He got so fucking mad. He ended up doing a pin pull, and he hurt himself worse. I'm like, fuck, you got, you got that motherfucker. To keep up, Louis embraced the pain. He would compete on one leg, blood running down his face, out of his nose. I walk in the gym over west side, and he had just had his knee scoped. And the next fucking day, he's in there squatting with us, bleeding everywhere. It literally looked like somebody just fucking shot him in the knee. I mean, I don't say shit, but like Chuck and them guys standing there go, dude, what the fuck are you doing in here? That thing, that you're busting open the, the damn stitches. Ah, eh, fuck that, you know, they ain't gonna fucking tell me what to do, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh my God. He's just wired up different. The men and women who trained in that dingy strip mall built West Side into a gym that defined an entire era of powerlifting. And then, they're just like old Buffalo. They just cut out of the herd and you cut down by the lines and they're gone. Me being at the head of the herd, I can't look back. You know, Satchel Page said, never look back. Someone might be catching up with you. By the early 2000s, Westside had outgrown the space on Demarest Road and had moved into a unit in a nearby industrial park. Most of the gym's iconic members had either left or retired, but Louie and Chuck were still there, and there were still plenty of young lifters willing to do anything to make it at Westside. I moved out to Westside with 400 bucks in my pocket. I was starving, I was homeless. I was stuck living in my car. I'd be on the phone with my dad, he'd go, yeah, yeah, my roommate's cool, the place is awesome, yeah, we got a big TV in here. I was sitting there staring at the roof of my car, like, what the fuck? <laughs> These two guys that I trained with at Westside, two of them were living in their fucking car when they were training. They were living in their car. That's what it meant to wear a Westside shirt. You're going to come and lift at my gym, I'm going to make you the baddest dude in the world, but you're not going to have a normal job, and you're barely going to have enough money to eat and sleep. Like many that came before him, Greg Panora didn't know what he was getting himself into. So when I went to Westside, basically all I did was change plates to get people coffees. Nobody gave a fuck who it was. And one day, John Stafford goes, hey, change the plates. So I'm putting plates on, and one of them I put on what he deemed was the wrong way. So he walks over, pulls all the plates off, and the bar goes flipping this way. The whole gym turns around staring at me. I talked to Louie a little after that. I'm like, Louie, I, I can't fucking do this all. I can't change people's fucking plates. This is not how I work. He goes, well, do something. I'm like, well, what, what should I do? He goes, get your name on the board. People will respect you. Once you get your name up there, you're the man. The place gym's yours. Me and George watched that dude do things, and we were like, Jesus Christ, this guy's going to take everybody's name off the board. Every time he competed, he would break a record. You figured that'd be a positive thing. Everybody would be like, yeah, man, that's great. No, not in there. There's only room, most of the time in most gyms, for one badass. For one guy to tell everybody else, you're going to do what I'm doing. I mean, if you if you know West Side, if you you're growing up the time when I did, Chuck D was a man. And Chuck's super super competitive, and he was starting to he was getting some dings and some injuries. I think they were really starting to take his toll on him at that point. I mean, he basically showed up to the gym wrapped in knee wraps like a fucking mummy. You know, it gets real work out. You know, Louie playing Louie, he's gonna be behind the strongest guy. It sort of started to become more and more like my gym. Chuck had dedicated his entire adult life to the gym. But now he seemed unsure of where he fit in. One day we were all sitting and eating, and Chuck's like, what are you going to do with the gym once you're done with it, or you're retired, or you die, or whatever? And Louie's like, I'm just shutting it down. It's over. And I think once Chuck heard that, I didn't think Chuck wanted to be a part of it anymore. He felt like he had put 20 years of his life into something that needed to be passed on to him, and it probably did. Chuck began to stray from the rest of the crew. After a while, he got a job as a bailiff on Friday, and uh, he had these guys that would come in and help him and train with him. I would train with Chuck on Saturday, and then Chuck brought in two other guys that, you know, really didn't train at West Side. Lou was like, you can't not train in the mornings on squat day. I don't know what the fuck you guys are doing training on fucking Saturdays. You're fucking up the whole training cycle, you know? Chuck was going to do his own thing anyways. Things came to a head at a meet in 2007. 
we went to a comp together and uh, we, we were, I believe, in the same weight class at that point. Louis' familiar nasal twang was calling depth for both lifters. Your coach can stand by the side referee and he'll give you a tap when you've squatted deep enough to come up. And Chuck wanted and that floor gets me off. And so I went on and I won. And, and I think Chuck, in, in Chuck's mind, sort of that Louis and I conspired against him to get him out of the gym. Chuck thought that Lou made him squat too deep after this guy had already given him a tap and Chuck hurt himself. Would he intentionally make someone miss? Nah. I don't think that he would do that to Chuck at me. I don't think that Lou would do that. Chuck had a lot of, uh, a lot of resentment. Realizing that the loyalty of the gym was not there in his favor, Chuck left and went to a small gym down in Grove City. I don't really know why Chuck left. I'd say the number one theory is the Greg Fenora theory. I was going to be the best lifter in there. I mean, that's what was going to happen. And Chuck, I don't think, liked that. I thought he's kind of a traitor, you know. I know he might be mad at him about one thing or another, but that doesn't mean you leave. This is your family. When Chuck left, a little piece of my sight died. Much as anybody doesn't want to admit it, it did. In Louis's own way, he was sad about it. That was probably like a son to him. He when he was a kid. I'm sure to this day it bothers him, you know, because you have that whole history with this this guy that you've had longer than anybody. When you thought of Westside, you thought of Louis Simmons, you thought of Chuck Vogel. I mean, Chuck and Louis, that, that partnership really helped multiply it with them together. And I sort of came in between it and it fucked it all up, you know? And I, I don't think people like me nearly as much as like, they like Chuck, you know what I mean? With Chuck's exit, Westside was thrown into chaos. Nearly half of the gym followed Chuck out the door. Amid the power vacuum, Matt Wenning decided to try and take the lead of the morning crew. So I'm in the morning. By default, I take the rain. Louie didn't like Matt taking over his position as far as telling him what to do. But the funny thing is, Matt was telling me the same stuff Louie was. Matt was just making it easier for me to understand. So Matt's like, right. I think everything started to change after that point. Louie is a great guy from a distance. Not from around him all the time. It's his way or the highway, and it can be a rough highway. In a matter of weeks, Matt was unceremoniously kicked out of the gym. It felt like your fucking dad just kicked you out of the house with nothing. I mean, those are the types of things where you're like, what is that loyalty, really? You know, I mean, when somebody sits down and tells you that you're never going to be anything without Westside, I don't know if that ever is repairable. So I left and went with Chuck. I'm like, Louis, what are you doing? Matt Wayne's is the best lifter in here. He's got to break a world record at some point. I went from seventh best in the world at Westside to the best in the world in eight months. I broke the total record and I broke the squat record. It was the best thing in the world that I took what I knew and go to his meet and beat him on his own ground and take his money. From 08 to 2010, we went to every one of their meets and killed them. That was probably Westside's darkest time. I will always hold a place in my heart for Westside, whether our relationship ever gets kindled, because I really don't talk to him anymore. I would rather see Chuck and Louie be on speaking terms again, because they had 20 years more heritage than I did. As Chuck Vogelpohl and Matt Wenning were seeking their vengeance across town, a gym built in Westside's own image was coming for their throne. You want to talk about gyms that was like this gym? There was one big iron. There was a guy named Rick Hussey that owned that. And Rick Hussey was pushing out some badass lifters. I wonder if Chuck's still alive because I, I, I have not seen him in the documentary. It was like the good guys and the bad guys. I mean, the big iron were the good guys, we were the bad guys, no doubt. That sort of caused a rift in the sport too. People were like, you know, these guys don't have bands and chains and shit. I mean, it was definitely two totally different kinds of training. I mean, people were sort of starting to see that maybe not West Side's not the only way, which is what Louis basically made America believe. So Louis was feeling a lot of pressure because Hussey had a lot of guys in the 198s and 220s at that time that were just destroying records. Big Iron looked to be the gym that may finally overtake West Side, but right at the height of their rivalry. Rick Hussey was diagnosed with cancer. Rick died when he was 49 years old. If he hadn't had such an untimely early death, they'd still be going strong. 
Back at Westside, Greg Panora had become the top lifter in the gym, but he was being chased by another transplant lifter from Indiana, Luke Edwards. We had some brutal fucking training sessions there. There were times that we would train so hard that we would be limping out of here because I wasn't going to quit and Greg wasn't going to quit. I always look back and I think that Greg was training optimally and Luke was training maximally. I would see them do the same numbers, but it always seemed effortless for Greg. You know, for Greg, I think when you win all the time, you start to not necessarily do the things that you need to do. I remember the day Luke beat Greg. The yeah, floor in front of the deadly fire was just drenched in blood. But I was barefoot. I remember I stepped in this pool of blood every time. How gross it felt my feet. And every pull, there more blood on the floor. We just kept going and going. And then Greg missed, and Luke got the weight. That was the moment that I saw in his face for the first time. He didn't know what the fuck just happened. I think that for, for, for Greg, that day began to make him question everything we did. The next squat workout, Greg came undone. I mean, the story was basically... We're box squatting. We want to box squat all the time. I didn't want to box squat all the time. And in his mind, he's like, the box is why I'm not getting stronger. And I told him, I said, you either have weak hips or your, your form is terrible. And he turned to me and he said, there's no way I got weak hips. I'm a world record holder. He reminded everybody he was the world record holder. He kept saying that over and over again. And, and we were like, yeah, we, we get it. Like, he was throwing it in my face. I think more than anybody because he knew that I didn't take that record from him. And Lou said, I don't give a fuck. And I blew up. And that was it. He walked out of the gym and, and left. When I turned around to leave, he was great. He goes, you know what sucks? You and I are the only people who ever know that you're the strongest person that's ever lived. He would still be the world record holder. And I know he knows. He, he hardly scratched his potential. I was like, I'll go to Lex. And he goes, I don't give a fuck what you do. And that was the last time we talked. Do you remember the last thing you said to him? Fuck you, Louie, you can suck my dick. <laughs> that's, that's what it was. When Greg left, I had no animosity towards Greg. If we'd have got in a fist fight, that would have been nothing. That means nothing to me. What meant something to me, a world record holder just walked out of my gym. World record holder. I just lost a world record. Greg was the strongest man in the world for five, seven years. It happened so fast. He got to the top, then he was gone. You go back in history, this happens over and over again. I said to Lou, I don't fucking get this. Who the fuck would leave this gym ever? I was just, I was just so sick of the whole thing. Wow, look at this round of back. I don't want to train anymore. No wonder they were people. all getting I'm not sure what I wanted, injured. Wasn't that. And I think that's what happens to a lot of lifters, and that's what Louis, Louis didn't quite understand. You might be the greatest lifter at Westside, but when you leave that place, don't give a fuck. Yeah, I like Greg, but he's not coming back. What happened six years ago happened. I can't change it now. I just gotta go on and get me a new world record holder. You know, it's like your girlfriend leaves you. you. Can't cry about it, go get you another girlfriend. What comes by every 20 minutes? So the lifters. It was harsh, right. maybe. And I remember there was just three guys in here. Louis had weathered the loss of Chuck and nearly all of his top guys in the span of just a few years. To restock his ranks after losing Greg, Louis expanded his recruiting efforts. He told me, I'm getting too old. You know what I wonder? Why didn't they squat full range of motion? Because I mean, man, full range of motion is one of the best things you can do developing power. I, I mean, look at all the Chinese weightlifters, what they do, uh, what they do nowadays. I mean, we have more technology, more knowledge about sports science, about lifting science. But wasn't it? I mean, it almost looks that it wasn't common. So what I've seen here in the documentary is like they were just doing like box squats. So squatting, sitting down, getting up. So you have like a 90 degree angle, so to speak. And they put around the, uh, the bands. So this was like their squat. And they were all having like their feet extremely wide apart. Maybe they, we maybe we see that in the documentary, but that's I would really wonder if somebody of you know knows why or what the reason for this was. Then please let me know. Generally curious. To has to prove that I can build elite level lifters. He was going to start trying to recruit the best lifters he could, and I said, "Is that a road that you want to go down?" 
because now you're going to bring in people who already think they have it figured out. The reason he did it is he wanted the best of the best. Let's bring in the best guys. Let's see what the body really can do. Recruiting from the outside was hit or miss. Quick success was often a precursor to an even faster fall. When I first started working with Louie and talking to Louie, I was a mid-21, 2,200-pound lifter. My lifetime goal was 2,500 pounds. 2,500 pounds was like rarefied air for me. Got that within a matter of 10 months. And then after that, I was done. When Brandon was here, he just couldn't do the training. It's high volume training. Brandon literally was having a problem with his pec for the day, and he, you know, he told Louie, he's like, man, I, you know, I think I'm going to blow my pec off. And Louie said, well, we don't save pecs around here. Basically saying, like, you better fucking get in the group, motherfucker. We go through a lot of people. I don't believe they know what they're getting into. You know, it's this romantic thing to be at Westside Barbell. Then they find out it's training. You got to train. I was there just short of a year. Louis was aware that I was highly distracted. He said, the reason that I have to let you go is I just can't have distractions. Louis had a system. And if he sees that something isn't going in the right direction, he's going to make the change. I'm no different than any other team. I'll throw a baby overboard to keep the ship from sinking. Fucking hated it for it. To me, it was it was a death sentence. Cause West Side was Everest. What the fuck do you do after Everest? He put it on me. See, he always made me the bad guy. People don't understand. Louis didn't kick most motherfuckers out. Them dudes kicked themselves out. These guys are in the mecca of powerlifting, the best gym in the world. They couldn't get out of their own way. As it turned out, while Louis was making a renewed effort to bring in new guys. The lifters who would get things back on track were already there. One of those key guys in the morning group was A.J. Roberts. After Greg left, it was divided, it was split. The morning crew had needed someone to follow. A.J. picked up Louis's methods quickly and came to serve <laughs> as a sort of translator for him within the gym. I had trouble because I couldn't communicate with people. A lot of the times, Louis just expected people to have this foundational knowledge. Because I understood what he was saying, I was able to simplify it down and go back to just the basics. AJ was pretty verbal. He was able to communicate with him like a player coach. I think for him, there'd been other guys in the gym like that. Guys like Dave Tate, guys like Matt Wenning, but that had been missing for so long. Me and Lou became very close, as close as you can get to Lou. 12 hours later in the evening group, Dave Hoff was coming into his own. Dave is special. He's like the Floyd Mayweather of powerlifting. Hmm. You know, the perfect story. Floyd Mayweather boxing. Dave had come to Westside as a kid. My first workout in there, I remember I met Louis Simmons. He didn't say much to me. He went in his office, walked out, and had this bench press shirt. He threw it to me and said, put this on, so we should bench. I benched 400. I was 15 years old. And I said, there's a Circleville bench meet coming up. If you impress us there, you can stay. And if you don't, you're out. Well, long story short, he took Kenny Patterson's all-time teenage world record and rode it to the fucking two inches from lockout. It was pretty impressive. So I threw him in with a group that no 16-year-old kid has ever been with. And the kid just started to grow. Weight's got your respect. And attitude got your respect. Some of the shit that used to come out of his mouth, I mean, he, I spent half my time keeping him from getting thrown out of here when he was young. It was hilarious. He told me he was going to out-squat me his first meet. I was like, come on, man. It just doesn't work that way, buddy. And he squatted 710. You know, like, fuck you, Bob. I just started out me seeing what I could do with him. Bob Coe was a master motivator. Also interesting that you see that they are doing, like, this plyometrics work. That's, that's also interesting why they implemented, like, these things. Because they are more on the fast twitch muscle side. To have this explosiveness, maybe that could be a reason. Because on the turning point of, for example, the bench, um, here to get off, you maybe need this explosiveness. But they just jumped, so that can't be it. So it maybe helps with the squat. I don't know. I can talk the talk. If I think you're down, I know how to reach in your soul and get you where you need to be. Naturally, he couldn't help but see what that motivation would do to Dave. One of the first full power meets I did, Bob walks up to me and he goes, wake up, motherfucker, and then smacks me across the face like hard, like man smack. I think it was the first and only time that I hit Dave with an open hand upside the head. And I found out at that point that I had to find another way of getting under the boy's skin 
before I was going to get seriously messed up. And if you've seen some of the videos of after he leaves the bench and where I end up, <laughs> you understand. Holy shit. <laughs> People get mad because I push people or people, you know what I mean? Well, people don't understand it. It's like, I'm trying to come out of, like, fight or flight, and somebody jumps in front of me. It scares the shit out of me, so I push them. You can always find Louie in a crowd because he always wears striped shirts and camo cargo pants. Look at that. That was Hoff's nickname when he was coming up and younger. I made them remember my name. They gave me nicknames, but they knew my name. This is the me I squatted 1,005 when I was 19. After Dave squatted 1,005 as a teenager, I was kind of out of ideas. When the gym splintered around Chuck's departure, Dave went with him. The best thing that Dave did was when he left this gym and went and trained with Chuck. Chuck taught Dave how to squat the way Dave squats now. After six short weeks, Bob Coe convinced Dave to return to the evening crew at Westside. And then me and Hoff started a short rivalry. At this point, it was like morning crew versus night crew. He had come back to Westside, but him and Lou had what not that chest. really reconnected. Lou never said it, but to him, the morning crew were the guys that wanted to be with Lou. And the fact that Dave chose to train in the evening, he saw it as almost like Dave was afraid to train with him. AJ and Dave brought Westside back to the forefront of men's power lifting. But on the other side of the board, the women of Westside had never fallen off. Even in the earliest days of Louis so Garage, let's talk about the women. the women had been phenomenal. I think the women put Westside Barbell on the map. They all just dominated. Two of Louis' most famous lifters early on were Laura Dodd and Mariah Leggett. Mariah and Laura were as good as it got. Mariah ended up winning the most WPC World Championships for female in history. Then, in the late 80s, Amy Weisberger came in and raised the bar for everyone. Amy, how did you get involved in this sport? I always wanted to be strong, and I always wanted to put more weight on the bar. Amy came from Cincinnati in 1987. I went up there and visited. Pretty quickly, I got the total that I needed to stay. Amy came here for 714 total, and Amy went on the total 1440. She's totaled 10 times body weight in two weight classes, and not many women can do that. The only woman ever to qualify at the time for the WPO. She is the strongest female power lifter pound for pound in the world. Amy made it to She's the probably WPO stronger than 80% of all the men on the planet. It made sense, since in the gym, she had been beating men from the very beginning. What got me kicked out is Amy Weisberger. Amy beat me, and Lou couldn't believe it, and he goes, get the fuck out of my gym. I said, I'll be back. A couple months later, I came back. I'm like, she's not gonna beat me this time. She damn near beat me every time. Amy would become one of the most accomplished female lifters of all time. But in the late 2000s, she passed the torch to the next queen of powerlifting, Laura Phelps. We were trying to get to Westside as soon as possible. Westside is invite only, so Laura's new to sport. No one knew who she was. And at that time, the WPO was the biggest the biggest show around in powerlifting. Went there and ended up opening higher than the world record. I just remember hearing Louis cheer for me. I think he just said, come on, new girl. Then we got invited to Westside. I mean, Laura Phelps, I believe, broke 34, 35 world records. I'm a stat person. I mean, Laura, just, there's no one can stack up to her. I have world records in four different weight classes. You can't really put anybody against her. She's got a 775 squat. There's not another woman that's within 20 pounds of that. As it stands now, She's heads and shoulders above everybody. Laura dominates women greater than any man dominates men. Between Laura, AJ, and Dave Hoff, Westside looked to be back to its old form. And it was almost like that was the new bond. By 2011, Louis was 63 years old and still competing. For 45 years, he had been a powerlifter. He had overcome broken backs, a ruptured patella, and even death. But finally, one day on the platform, Louis Simmons came to the end of the road. I was backspawned in the day he decided to never compete again. We were at a meet, and I could see he was right back where he was, you know, 20 years ago. He was there to break some records. I was actually doing 10 yard squat and 800 pounds at 63 years old. And then we go out for the squat. He gets red lights on deck. Louis, with his age and everything, going super deep is never his goal anymore. He wants to get it in, get out. So goes a second time and, and the hallway passes out 
and we pull him up. I told him what happened. He passed out. He said, get me out of this shit. And he just sits there and he's just silent. And he said, I'm done. And I just thought he meant he's done for the day. He goes, no, West Side's done. And I didn't really know what to say to him, so I kind of just left him. I came back over and over and over and over and over. And I kept wondering, how many generations am I going to go through until one of them gets me? I realized this is it. I'm going to end up past the hospital. I'm in grave. I didn't know what was going to happen. He showed up Monday like nothing had happened. We never spoke about it again. It's just a moment that he had. And I'm fucking glad he didn't quit. <laughs> As AJ worried about Louis quitting, he had no idea that his own days at Westside were numbered. Everything I said I was going to do, I did. The only thing I wanted to do now was squat 1,200 pounds. And I was willing to push myself as far as I could go. I was 320 pounds, severe sleep apnea. I would just stop breathing, wake up choking, scared that I may die in my sleep. I knew that I was pushing shit to the extreme. I just had to fucking make it to my last meet. March 2013, I stepped up, hit that 1,200 pound squat. And I remember eating breakfast with Lou the next morning. Lou said, if you could just get your weight to 350, I think you could go after the all-time record. And for the first time ever, I looked at him and thought he was just fucking insane. And in that moment, I knew that mentally, I didn't have what it took anymore. The dilemma that AJ faced of trying to square his own health and mortality with the price of the iron was nothing unexpected. Embrace of that risk was the only way to make it to the top. If you don't want to die to do this, you shouldn't do this. We're fucking thoroughbred horses. If we break our leg, pick us out back and fucking shoot us. That's how it works. The idea of gaining one more pound on your lift, losing a year on your life, you trade it in all day long. No one knew this better than Luke Edwards. His whole life, he had dreamed of pulling 900. Just as he was on the doorstep of making that dream into a reality, fate intervened. I remember the day that I pulled 840, it felt like 315 in my hands. And they always say, you know, there's another meet. Well, for me, when I pulled 840, I was in the hospital about three weeks later. He came there sick. He had the same disease as Lonzo morning. When I was 17, I started puking every morning. By the time I was 24, 25, I was in stage two kidney failure. After my first transplant, I came back and I squatted a thousand. We haven't been talking here um, is Yes, they might be all having some medical problems, medical issues, health problems, but do you think really they all were like sober and not juiced? I don't think so. I highly doubt it. Highly doubt it. Goddamn do I doubt. No, they were all on juice. About two and a half years into my transplant, I rejected. So that's when I started dialysis. And even while on dialysis, I didn't miss a workout. I never missed work, and I took pride in that. I never let anybody feel sorry for me, no matter where I was. Luke, sicker than shit. And the only thing we notice is just him getting weaker. For Luke, the hardest part was how Louis looked at him after the transplants. It was almost heartbreaking to come in and Louis not messing with you or talking to you because he knew that you didn't have the potential to break a world record anymore. But the warrior inside of Luke wasn't ready to put the bar down. He planned on going to another meet. Will he die? I don't know. If he does, it's on Luke. He knows what it's like to be there, and then all of a sudden you can't do it. It always eats at me because it's like I should have tried 900 that day because it was there. And maybe that's why I'm still in the gym. Maybe had I pulled 900, maybe I would have left too. In 2013, Dave Hoff finally did it. At only 25 years old, he posted a 3,005 pound total, the highest ever. In the history of Westside, Westside never had the biggest total of all time. If somebody asked me what was the greatest thing I could have ever given to Louis Simmons, it'd have been that. That's the only thing, he wanted the biggest ever. He wanted the all time highest, pound for pound, weight for weight. He was you know, recruiting people in from around the world and Dave just happened to be a local guy. Dave's pretty much broke about every record there is to break. Let's count this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
7 times 25 on each side. What do we got? 7 times 25. That can't be right. Ah, uh, 7, yeah, that makes 14. 14 times 24, 350 bench. 350 somewhat plus the 20. 370, that's somewhere around 390, 400. The minute you get to the top, everybody's picking you apart. Hoff had climbed to the top of the mountain just as the sport was crossing paths with social media. His arms are so short, he can't even jerk off. I think my arms are pretty normal. Thank you for your concern. Across multiply powerlifting, cell phone cameras were calling judging standards into question. Let's just face it, a lot of multiply squats, me included, are slightly at or above parallel. The knee has to be above the hip crease. When I look at Dave and that 3,005 pound total, we have that blemish that was the squat. Everybody trashed that lift. Rewind, Dave hit like a 29.45 or a 29.55 with what I thought was a very, very good 11.40 squat. Wouldn't you rather have that on the record books? I, I go by what those three judges give me. You motherfuckers aren't gonna get me to discredit a fucking thing I did. I got under it and two out of at least three people thought it was good that were sitting right there. It's an opinion after that. Hoff's timing was, was kind of unfortunate for him. He's operating in multiply gear in a day where there's a big exodus to raw. The future of powerlifting is gonna change like it already has to completely raw. And the reason it's going to is because of CrossFit. Millions and millions of people are seeing this on TV with no equipment and people can relate to it because that's what you see at the gym. And when you get an influx like that, it shifts people's focus. They wanna see something they understand. If you put me on a video with this big ass diaper suit on, you're like, what is he wearing? Is it a diaper? Is he gonna take a shit? The shift to Raw emptied out the ranks of geared powerlifting. So now, Westside Barbell goes to me, and who's there to compete against Dave Hall? Powerlifting has changed. Where in the fuck is Westside Barbell? Where is Louis Simmons in all this? I think it's cowardly, that's the only way I could put it. He's always talked about his gym being the strongest gym in the world, and they were but he no longer has the strongest gym in the world because people are lifting raw. Anyone can lift raw, it's easy. I lift raw all the time. People think that the guys that are choosing to avoid raw, they just no desire to compete raw. They don't wake up obsessed with the raw numbers. I don't, I don't train to have a big raw squat. I train to have the biggest squat. While Westside never truly embraced raw lifting, well, that looked easy. Louis did have a trio of supersized raw competitors. Burley Hawk. Burley Hawk. Squat 900 like that, but no gear. 615 bench. Nick Winters. I'm not sure that everybody's made strong Nick Winters on the planet. He benched 750. Raw, he died of an uh, enlarged heart. And Chris Spieger, the first American to deadlift 915 pounds raw. Between the three men, Westside became one of the only gyms on the planet to produce a 900 pound raw squat, a 700 pound raw bench press, and a 900 pound raw deadlift. Who's got one of those in this country? You say, oh yeah, we do. Squat and deadlift the same numbers. Success, Westside's raw lifters went mostly unnoticed, both inside and outside of the gym. In the years since losing AJ Roberts, Louie has had to reinvent his morning crew for one last ride. Yeah, I'm 70 years old now. This is my last raw. Your life's in chapters. In the beginning, it's a long chapter. You get into the last chapter, it's a short chapter. I've only got so many years. And that's why I realize I have to pick up the pace. I can't slow down. Well, right now, I mean, I think my gym's down, but I still have four people that are capable of all-time world records. And I think it's down. I mean, you go knock on any door in the world, you're gonna have to find hard press, find someone who's got two all-time world records in that gym. But we got four, and I think we're down. There's times where he seems super happy and super excited the direction the gym's going. And then there's times where he's frustrated because he has all the talent in the world, but they're not producing. A lot of the times what he's really doing is he, he's, he's going into his mind to figure out what needs to happen. And sometimes it takes him longer than most people realize. And so there'll be months where he seems off his game, but then he gets through that and he gets back to the loo that you thought you knew. So he's always assessing where, where we're at, what we need, 
who needs to be brought in, who needs to be taken out. He's a lot more calculated than most people realize. And I think that he essentially, you know, knows ultimately what he wants. What you're looking at is a brand new group. So I have to start with new soldiers. The loudest and most veteran of those soldiers is Jason Coker. I bring a little attitude to the morning crew. I'm loud, uh, I'm obnoxious. Jason is a retread from Big Iron with major miles on him. Coker's about on the last legs. He just maxes out all the time. You know, he's his own worst enemy. Anyone can train when they're 100%. That's not hard. But let's see what happens when you get tore up. It's you against the weights. You're either gonna move the weight or that shit's gonna crush you or hurt you. And it's done both to me. It's crushed me and it's fucked me up. If you look on a YouTube, there's a video of me dumping 900 pounds right on my face. It knocked me out. Literally, it came down right on my fucking head. Louie and Coker understand each other better than most in the gym. We fucking argue and bitch at each other all the time. A lot of times I know he's right, but I don't fucking tell him that shit. I'm not even giving him satisfaction. He doesn't want somebody in there that's gonna fucking just put their head down and say, yes, sir. He wants to be able to talk shit to you and you're gonna pop right back off at him. That's one of the issues he has now with some of the, a lot of the guys in the gym are very introverted and quiet and it drives them crazy. I try to get my guys to go down there and have that competitive thing where we did. Like, I'm gonna win or I'm gonna die. I can't get them to do that. And I think that's the difference why it may keep them from being great. Every now and then, Louis turns back the clock to teach Coker a lesson. No church music! It's not even so much him trying to prove a point, I think, to anybody No church else. music. <laughs> to point to himself. Every fucking week, just about, he'll start doing rag pulls. How many ancient motherfuckers like Louis could do what Louis does? He can handle more than most youngsters can. Oh, he loves... It's his old man strength. If you show him that something gets to you, he's like a fucking lion. He's gonna that's click the that dream. Man. Whatever one makes you fucking click. Having this old man strength. He's gonna use it. He said he's embarrassed that he only pulled 615. If people saw the pathology in his spine, they would say, you probably shouldn't be doing that, but it's Louis. He's gonna do whatever he wants to do. Louis' problem is he's too strong. Like, for an old guy, he is too strong for his body. Like, if you get him pissed off, he will do something. And he will just, he'll hurt himself. What else I got? I'm hooked onto that white whale. I got nowhere to go. What else am I going to do? I'm going to go down with that whale. <laughs> He's going to drag me to the bottom eventually. And I don't care. You know, that's what I want. It kills him that he can't train the way he wants to train. You can see it every day in his eyes. Like it just drives him insane that he can't output as much horsepower as he wants to. It kills him that he has to do accessory work for health, not for strength. It drove me crazy this day. It fucking pisses me because I can't compete. I go down and look at my guys. They're not doing nothing. And I can't relate to them. You know, so I'm, I'm screwed. I'm in the middle of heaven and hell. Most of the lifters in his gym have no connection to the world that shaped Louis. I can't go up there and get in their face. I can't give them a shove. I can't do shit, you know, that they do to me and, and I used to do them, they do to me. It just seemed like society's changing. I mean, maybe it's my fault that the world's changed because I didn't change with it, but I can't change. It's often the smaller things that remind him of the distance between them. My guys, they can't do a fucking thing without a phone. I said, I mean, I used to play my dick. You play with your phone. It's a big difference. This is the most chaotic generation for him. Technology, social media. He fucking hates having phones in the gym. People recording. You know, like doing this interview right now, this is like not very easy for me to do. But he just accepts it. He's like, this is the age we're in. As his frustrations with powerlifting grow, Louis has broadened his attention to other sports. If I was to guess, he's kind of split between a couple different worlds right now. And from what I understand, he's working with a lot of athletes. I think that the athletes that he's working with that you know, are the, the non-powerlifters are a different challenge for him. Uh, a lot of people think, Westside Barbell powerlifting. Well, Westside Barbell is 5% powerlifting, 95% sports, but people don't know. He's done the same thing with those sports that he did with powerlifting. Today, there is hardly a sport that hasn't been touched by Westside. Our guys have performed really well in these last several years, and I attribute Louie to a lot of that. Louie's influence has definitely been felt around the world. 
and he's taught me more than anybody else has, to be honest with you. The system that Louie has in place works. I mean, it's what I used for the majority of my NFL career and what I still do to this day. Back in 2003, the off season, I started to integrate it. We went to the World Series that year. We've been there four times and won twice. This gym's got more to offer than squat, bench, and deadlift. While ball players, track athletes, and crossfitters are common visitors, the athletes that have always held a special bond with Westside are the fighters. I mean, 54 to 58. 60's gonna be a hard press for me. Where this all stems from is Louis is a humongous fighter, man. He always had boxers. They had a boxing ring, I think, in the gym. No, it's going to be interesting. So they did that. And I think MMA was introduced when really Kevin Randall came in. I worked with Kevin Randall as UFC heavyweight champion. And when I came here, Matt Brown was just started coming in. I assumed it was probably just a low level gym. Some guy just renting out a place in the back of this industrial park. Louie came up to me. He, he had been lifting and he had a, a bloody nose and blood coming out of his ears. And he just wiped his face like, like this and loved to have you. And that was when I realized this is my kind of place. And I think if, if MMA was around back then, I think West Side may have steered more to MMA. My buddy Mark Marinelli, he patterned his gym after us. Strong style MMA. Mark has trained here for about. 10, 15 years, he's one of the one of the OGs of West Side. He's one of the most successful MMA gyms. He's a very successful MMA teacher now. You got Steve Page and Jessica Evil Eye. When they first started off before they started there now, they came at a really early age, and that's cousin Marcus. And he is the same as I am. I look at him how nutty he is. He's just like me. Except he can't kick people's ass. It's not a stretch to think that if Louis were born today, he'd have been a fighter instead. On a cold morning in late 2015, Chuck came back. He showed up at <coughs> breakfast at Bob Evans out of the blue. I don't think from what I understand, him and Louie had even spoke. The first thing me and Tommy did, we looked at each other and we were like, what the fuck? Nearly a decade removed from his dramatic departure, he returned without a word. No one knows quite what brought him back, but it's easy to think that perhaps, like Louie, he was now a relic of a bygone era a ghost tasked to haunt the walls he had defined for so long. That's a Westsider. You know, you, once a Westsider, you're always a Westsider. Some people might not want to admit it. It's hard for a Westsider to leave. With his return, Chuck seems to have resurrected a host of old and broken souls from Westside. That's what training is when you're all fucked up down there. Chuck's real. He's real from the start. Real and right. But Chuck's most valuable contribution to the gym thus far may have been his least expected. In 2017, Dave Hoff returned to the platform, four years removed from the pinnacle of the sport. I walked into that meet. I remember I come around the corner, and uh, he was glowing right there by the monolith. It was Chuck, Chuck Vogelpool. If he hadn't been there, it wouldn't have happened. Him being there brought something up me that like people like Bob Coe did. Like, I felt like I couldn't fail him. It really had nothing to do with anybody else. With the assist from Chuck, Dave Hoff did it again. 3,010 pounds. Four years for five pounds. That's what I did. I had to go through four years of hell just for five fucking pounds. But man, I didn't, I, I wanted that fucking, that, if you do it twice, it's not an accident. Do it once, it might be an accident. Do it twice, it ain't an accident. Well, that was the start of whatever's getting ready to happen next. From a distance, Westside is callous and unforgiving, an iron hell for self-loathing sadists. Its legacy is steeped in blood and broken relationships. For every memory and moment of glory, there has been a profound cost. There is nothing easy about this gym. You're not gonna come in there and take from that place and not give anything. We busted our ass and gave up 
15 years, some of them 20 years, you know, some of them 20% of their life. My son was a state champion swimmer. Uh, I never saw none of his swim meets. They were on Wednesday night. And Wednesday night was bench press night, so I was here. And for all their troubles, there is no applause from Louis, only the next task. In all the years I was there, I was told, good job one fucking time. And it was on a floor press and I beat my record by five pounds and did 520. All right, that's how detailed I can remember it. No matter how good you guys are, they're good. They're not good enough for me. They're just not, okay? I was never good enough for me. So if you're seeking approval from Louis Simmons, you're gonna be highly disappointed. So it's not there. Louis has created this environment where his guys will literally die for him. You wouldn't think this guy, who's this like ringleader of these badasses, would be able to get such admiration, but he's honestly done it with love. Louis's affection for his athletes may go unnoticed to the outside world, but in truth, it's always been his secret to success. I think that that's why the gym is so successful because there's so much invested I mean, you gotta realize, I actually care. When he's in the gym, he's hardcore, but when you pull him to the side and say, I need help, he's gonna help. Louie would have done anything in the world for me, and I know this. There's stories where Louie has picked people up, bailed people out of jail, paid for attorneys. Louie's always been a really good guy to me. The first worst injury I had when I, I blew the fuck out of my knee. I had a sponsor back then, sponsored in contact me for seven weeks. By the time I got home, Louis already had sleds, chains, bands. Fuck. At my house with a call. You, you need anything? Call me. Whew. That's why I always support Louis Simmons. Because that's the side that people don't see. Uh, it's hard because my father just passed. But if I had a second father, it would be Louie. But he probably taught me more about being a man than my dad. As far as powerlifting goes, there's, I, don't, I don't think there's anybody gave up as much as Louie has. Louie's whole life is that gym. All my memories and all my friends are in that gym. Every one of the guys in my gym is a brick that went into the wall for a side. I had the ideas, but they had to prove my ideas. They're always going to be a part of me till the day I die. There's a tattoo on my arm right here. It says, born 10, 12, 47, died, never. And in my lifetime, it'll be true. The future of Westside may not be clear, but its effect on the world of strength and athletics will be felt for a long time to come. Westside Barbell and Louis Simmons changed powerlifting. And whether you liked it or not, it happened. I don't think there'll ever be another Westside Barbell. I am Westside. Before Westside Barbell, there was never a Westside. And after Westside, there'll never be a Westside. That's why we watch this shit. And we can spread the word. Three, th 3014, 2008, David Hoff. As far as a friendship goes, yes, I consider him a friend, but I also know that when I'm no longer putting up good numbers, I'm dead to him. Now, my dream is to find another guy. 
find another big guy. There's some real strong guys right down, not far from here. Real strong, real young. Let's get them in here. Wow, 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 wow. If this shit wasn't crazy, then I don't know what was. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you say, man. That was. Oh my god. That man is such an inspiration. Wow. If you watched until here, or if you watch this um, not on live, maybe later somewhere, tell me how you think this was. And I don't know. I cannot speak into how inspirational that was. And man, that he's gone through that much still going still has his mission and his strength is this old man's strength man that's something i want to have when i'm old that's why we're training and that's why i'm going every time with as much as i can give until then it's west side wow versus the motherfucking world. have a nice sunday evening and let's see you in the next one ciao